everyone. Uh, as, as, as Hans indicated, uh, I have uh, somewhat of uh, a, a unique background for this presentation in the sense that I both have uh, quite a bit of experience in the telecommunications industry and, and as well as in the copper industry. So, um, so a, a lot of what I, I'm, I'm, I've uh, prepared today uh, might reflect that. And uh, as stated, the title of, of my talk today is High Speed Data Cables, Energy Efficient High Speed Data Connections for Data Centers and Local Area Networks. Um, I thought I would start out by defining a little bit what is meant by high speed and what is meant by data cables. Uh, it's, the, the talk is going to start out a little bit slowly so I can give a little bit of context uh, uh, so that the technical details will perhaps make a little bit more sense, but I promise it will go faster as time goes on and there will be time at the end for as many questions as our host will allow. In the computer network world, high speed, what high speed is, depends quite a lot on who you ask and what their needs are. As a user, high speed means that the connection is not a limiting factor in whatever application or the type of communication you are using and the type of data you are transporting. For example, if you are sending text messages over Skype, you're typing text, a simple telephone line and a 300 baud modem is probably more than adequate. That, it, that is unless you can type much faster than I can. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to send multiple high-definition video streams over the same connection without delays or any noticeable quality degradation, then a 100 base T Ethernet or a 100 megabit per second connection may not be fast enough. And end-to-end -end connections in the gigabit range might be necessary. As a user, when one is not constrained by the connection speeds, that old, there's an old saying it came out of Sun Microsystems initially that the network is the computer and this also is a lot of what we today know as, as cloud services starts to be meaningful because it, it then no longer matters where your data is stored, it doesn't matter where your application is stored, everything, the, the, the entire network looks to the user as if it resides right on the user's computer. As a network designer, one needs to worry more about how many users there are, what are the peak and average traffic loads, and what are the data speed expectations for each set of users. High speed to a network designer might mean that when all of the user traffic comes together at an aggregation point or a switch or a router and is sent into the core of the network, that there's enough bandwidth, there's enough data rate to provide all the users with, with the quote unquote high speed that they expect. As an application developer, when one looks, one looks at, at things like data structures and data quantities, and what do I need to provide to a user or to, to, a, to, a, to a server to provide a particular service, such as real-time video conferencing or electronic access control for a, for a metro system in a major city or in a theme park or in a stadium. To developers, high speed means having enough data speed to support all of the features for whatever the application is that, that they happen to be developing. So depending on who you ask and what they're doing, high speed can really mean anything from a really good telegraph operator to hundreds of gigabits per second or more. Then the question is, and the subject of this talk today, what data cables are the right ones to support those high speed services that are required? Data cables are devices that carry our precious information signals from wherever we are to wherever we want them to go and to or from whatever information we seek and where that information resides. When we talk about an information transmission medium that is shared amongst many users, like a network, we can divide that space by time. That is, we can take turns transmitting or receiving, sending out data only when no one else is using the channel. We can divide it by frequency. We can let everyone send information at the same time, but we give everybody a, a separate frequency band to use. 
much like you see in, 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 in radio and television today. We can, we can do it by coding the information. We can let everyone send information all at the same time, all over the same frequencies. But then we have to arrange the data such that uh, the code in the information allows only one receiver to receive the information that was sent. That's a, a little bit more advanced topic. Or we can divide it in space. We can send the information over a reserved physical path, such as a cable. For those of you who have used, for example, a, a public Wi-Fi point in a crowded public place, or maybe better said, attempted to use uh, in, in a crowded public place, you've probably observed how quickly the speed goes down when there are a lot of users. Wi-Fi typically uses some combinations of time, frequency, and code multiplexing to maximize the connection speeds for all the users. And yet, despite the bandwidth that's available, it still doesn't take very long to run out of bandwidth when many people want to access, for example, a wireless network at their expected high speed. Then the only thing left to do then is to give every user his own space, his own channel, often in the form of a cable, uh, and at the network core distribution points, also cables, to make sure that those cables are fast enough to handle the shared loads. Today, most of the cables that fit the requirements are in the form of fiber optics, as you see here, co coaxial cables, or twisted pairs. For example, just about everyone who hasn't been living continuously in an underground cave for the past quarter century or so has probably used a mobile telephone or at least seen one used. These days, mobile phones are pretty easy to use. You just dial the number or click an icon, and within a couple of seconds, you are connected with just about any other mobile or fixed line telephone in the world. However, the number of networks and cables that the data needs to be sent over just to co connect that call is rather complex. First, the call. Remember, the call these days is, in principle, nothing but a stream of bits carrying information is processed inside the mobile device, sent on a bus over a really small cable of sorts, to a modulator inside the device that converts the signal to a radio frequency, and it sends the signal to the device antenna over another cable of sorts, where the signal radiates outward until it reaches the antenna of the nearest uh, cell tower, or, or maybe the least busy cell tower. At the tower, the signal is received off the antenna probably onto some kind of coaxial cable, amplified, demodulated, or turned back into bits, then sent on another cable, probably a twisted pair or an optical fiber, to a local switch. From the switch, the call is routed over more cables, probably with more capacity, to a switching center. From the switching center, the call, the call data is sent to various databases to find out if the user is, user is authorized, if the user has kept his or her account current, uh, and maybe if they are roaming, what roaming charges and what roaming privileges apply. Then an authorization message is sent back through the network to the local switch and ultimately to the mobile device. And then the call setup sequence begins. And eventually, the phone begins to ring. This all occurs billions of times per day and it normally only takes a couple of seconds, even though the signal travels up to thousands of kilometers over coaxial cable, fiber optics, twisted pair, and passes through multiple routers and switches. Of course, with this seamless service in mind, the poor designer has to pick cables that meet all the requirements that are the lowest cost, yet allow for future growth, are energy efficient, and can be installed easily, and of course virtually never fail. It's, it's not a trivial job much of the time. So with all the networking and cable complexity that I just described in the background, there are trends on the user side driving demand for network speed. There's the so-called Nielsen's Law, which I've, I've shown here on the graph. Uh, which shows that connection speeds are increasing steadily at a rate of about 50% per year, at least over the past 30 years or so. And so far, it shows no signs of, of slowing down. 
If one compares Nielsen's law to Moore's law, that's the, the, the famous law that predicts the increase in computer performance, which is about 60% per year, it seems that computer performance will be able to support the current trends for, for connection performance for increasingly fast user connections. When one then compares the increases in user connection with the increases in, in international internet bandwidth, as, as you see in this slide, uh, in, which in 2012, the latest data I had, was growing at a relatively slow rate of 40% per year, it becomes apparent that the pressure on the network aggregation points, the data centers, the internet service providers and such, and the core of the network will be, will, will, will feel the most pressure from the continued growth in, in user connection speeds and in, 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 in data, data, data bandwidth demands. So in any case, it's clear that the demand for data capacity for individual users, as well as network operators, continues to grow rapidly, which brings to an important question for people for people deciding the, uh, how to support that growth. How can the network designer provide connections that are efficient and affordable, and at the same time support the speeds required for the next five to 10 years? The answer to that question, to answer that question, one needs to look very carefully at the available cabling alternatives, as well as how those alternatives will be purchased, deployed, and maintained. Uh, one option, especially in terms of very high data speed that will support future bandwidth and growth demands, is optical fiber. Optical fiber has been around, I don't know, since the 1960s, certainly in the 1970s, as a viable communication cabling medium. Optical fiber works by sending very short, very rapid pulses of typically laser light through very small glass fiber. Because of the speeds with which laser light pulses can be modulated, the potential speeds for optical fiber can support, the, the potential speeds that optical fibers can, can support are very impressive. But more on that in a moment. Optical fibers are made by pulling cores of very fine fibers of very highly pure optical glass. These cores are then surrounded by a cladding of glass with a, with a lower refractive index as the core. The difference in the refractive index helps keep the light contained inside the core of the fiber through a process known as internal reflection. The outside of the cladding is then covered with a protective jacket, and the ends of the fiber are terminated with precise, with precise optical coupling and connector that allows the laser light to be directed efficiently into and out of the fiber to, for detection or re repeater circuitry at both ends of the cable. Optical fibers come in two basic flavors, flavors single mode and multi-mode. As you see here, there's, there's actually three fibers there because there are a couple of sub-flavors of, of multi-mode. Single mode fibers have a very narrow core, uh, which does not allow the light to bounce through the fiber in multiple paths. And, it, and this has the good property that it keeps the pulses from spreading out or dispersing. Lower dispersion causes less uh, interference between the light pulses and allows for faster data transfer and or longer transmit uh, distances. If you look at the, at the sketches now, you see uh, below there are, on to the left, there is a picture of, of three fibers. The first two on the left are multi-mode fibers, and you see the core is, is somewhat larger. It's between 62 and a half and 50 microns and usually the whole overall outside diameter of the glass fiber with, with the, um, the jacket, with, 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 with the outside uh, cladding, is, is about 125 micro, uh, microns, micrometers. And with the multi-mode fibers, if you look now to the right, you'll see the wider core gives the light a little bit more room to, to bounce around. And what that essentially does is if you look, compare on the left side of the right picture, there are short light pulses as their input. 
And as the light goes down the, 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 the cable and bounces around, it has a tendency to spread out. And then you see on the output pulse on the, on the right side of the picture is a little bit wider. And why is that a problem? Well, because I'm sending the information as a series of pulses. So at the detection end, how do I then figure out where one pulse starts or one pulse ends and the next pulse starts? So that, that kind, of, kind of limits how fast I can send the pulses. And the way to mitigate that, or at least to minimize that dispersion, you can't completely eliminate it, is to make the core so narrow that the light can't bounce around very much. Uh, as sort of an intermediate stage between the multimode above where you see the fiber was made with a, a, a high refractive index core and a lower refractive index cladding where, where it's a sharp, sharp boundary between the core and the cladding, there's something called a multimode graded index core or the LAN core where the refractive index actually doesn't change in an instant from core to cladding, but it kind of has a, has a gradation. It's, it's, it's called graded. And the light, instead of bouncing, kind of sort of bends a little bit. It goes out and bends in and comes back. And that allows for slightly higher performance in a multi-mode fiber. Now, multi-mode fibers tend to be uh, less expensive than single-mode fibers, uh, but still provides pretty good performance. This next slide is an overview of, of optical fiber technologies. It's a short description. I'm not going to go through all the things in there. You can read it yourself e either now or later, depending on how fast you read. But uh, it's a short description of the basic types of optical fiber technologies, the fibers themselves, uh, the kinds of illumination lasers that are available. And at the bottom, there is a small color coding chart. So you can get at a glance, uh, so you can see at a glance what kinds of grades of fibers are being used in a particular installation. And uh, later, like w whenever you're doing maintenance and, and other installations, you can, you can see very quickly what kinds of fibers are being used and where those fibers go for, for troubleshooting and, and lots of other, uh, other network organizational reasons. As a general rule, if it's yellow or red, it's single mode. And if it's some other color, it's, 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 it's multi-mode fiber. Here's another slide that shows the typical speeds and ranges uh, for fiber optic transmittal. In general, fiber optic data speeds you can see there are, are, are pretty high. They're in the, in the hundreds of megabits, gigabit range, 100 gigabit range. Uh, Multimode fibers generally have reaches on the order in terms of distance of a couple of hundred meters, while single mode fibers can, can transmit dozens or in some cases even hundreds of kilometers. Uh, without having to use a repeater. So if you, if you think again, if you have high data rates, long distances, fiber optic is, is very interesting. So here are a few key parameters that determine optical fiber performance. It, you know, it, it's in, in an analogous way to electrical cables, the idea is to minimize the attenuation of, light, of the light signals as they propagate down the cable, use very pure glass, minimize the imperfections, the cracks, the scratches, um, and reduce stray reflections and dispersions in the light. So the surface quality on the core, the surface quality on the cladding is very important. The precision and the polish of the connectors and, and on, on splices in the cable is also important. You know, those kinds of things can all cause losses, and they all need to be minimized. So so what, what limits the speed? It's, it's it's, it's, it's the lasers. How fast can the lasers send pulses? How much light is absorbed in the cable? You know, as, as, as you think about transmitting light through glass, it, no matter how good the glass is, there's usually some, some, some absorption. So at, at some distance away, you won't be able to see the light anymore. So, so the lower that absorption rate is, the farther you can send the, send the signal. And also dispersions because different light frequencies, even laser light, when it's pulsed on and off, has a frequency content. And those frequencies tend to travel in different speeds. And over, over distance, the, 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 what starts out as a very sharp pulse, as you saw in the earlier slide, tend to spread out a little bit. So, so the less spreading out that you get in the glass, and, and then 
the faster and, and longer transmission distances uh, can be used. And in summary, just a couple of things. The, the applications where optical fiber is a particular advantage are those where data rates are high and they need to be supplied over very, very long distances. Uh, here's a picture of a typical long distance fiber optic cable. You can see there are actually many glass fibers that are installed in the center of the core. And surrounding those, those, those glass fibers is, are multiple protective jackets, which may have some various foams or, or gels or air inside so that they're resistant to bending and twisting. And, and, and those jackets themselves have a little bit of a spiral twist to them. So when the cable is bent, it, it puts less stress on the cables. And uh, so, so as you can see, over, over long distances with, 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 with lots of data, fiber optics is, is rather interesting. Now let's look at the second major type of data cable, coaxial cables. In many ways, the job of the coaxial cable is the same as the optical fiber. To deliver an impulse, in this case an electrical field instead of a light pulse, from one end of the cable to the other with a minimum possible attenuation and distortion. Physically, the pulses are transmitted as trans transverse elect electromagnetic waves, essentially radio waves, that travel down the cable between that, that center core, that center conductor, and the shield conductor on the outside. In addition to being useful in radio engineering applications, coaxial cables were actually uh, used quite early on in, in LAN or local area network designs because of their ease of installation, their low losses, their good bandwidth or, or data speed, as well as being relatively easy to install. Um, I wrote down the equation here, the Z0, which is the characteristic impedance of the coaxial cable to remind me of a couple of points. First, the impedance of the cable can best be understood as a function of both the geometry of the cable combined with a, a, a sense of the ratio of inductance to capacitance that exists on the cable. Actually, it's the square root of, of that ratio. Coaxial cables with lower impedance, impedance says, and about 30 ohms is a typical lower bound on impedance, can also handle higher power loads more readily due to the lower losses in the dielectric or the insulator. While coaxial cables with higher impedances, maybe 200 ohms or so is a typical upper bound for practical cables, uh, tend to have lower capacitance. And thus, it's easier to transmit waveforms with high rise and fall times. Um, such uh, high rise and fall times can, can enhance the timing, you know, the timing of certain network control signals. And it may be even able to increase the bandwidth of the cable. What is also important about the impedance of a cable, more so than the absolute value of whatever the impedance is, is the requirement that the impedance remain as constant as possible over the entire length of the cable. Any change in impedance, particularly a sudden or large one, gives the potential to cause a reflection that interferes with the primary signal or losses, or also can cause losses that make the signal more difficult to detect at the end of the cable. This sensitivity to changes in impedance is one of the main reasons why not only is high quality of construction of an electrical cable important, but also why it's important that the cable is not damaged, kinked, or otherwise abused during installation, and why terminations of the cable into repeaters, modems, patch panels is critical and has to be done carefully. Anywhere there's an impedance mismatch, which is, is the analog to a to a reflection in a fiber optic cable, there is potential for performance, uh, for potential for performance degradation. Here's another list. It's, it's, it's a bit of an eye chart, and, and you can read this in your, in your free time. But um, coaxial cables, here's, here's a list of, of, of standard coaxial cables. And one thing you'll notice is the vast majority of the cables have impedance of, of 50 ohms or 75 ohms. And there are some historical reasons for that. Um, 75 ohms just happens to be very close to the impedance of a uh, center-fed dipole antenna. Uh, 
which when you want to talk about uh, transmitting uh, cable television signals to, a, to the head end of a cable is important so that the impedance, again, is, 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 is when the impedance is matched, you get less reflections, you get higher throughput, higher performance. Uh, so a 75 ohm cable, coaxial cable that can be fed directly to an antenna is particularly uh, useful. Um, 50 ohms is also a, a, a popular impedance, mostly because it's a, a little bit of a trade-off between the lower impedances that have uh, higher power capacity, and yet it's not so far off from 75 ohms that uh, it still matches up pretty well when, when, you, when you use the cables in, in radio frequency kinds of, kinds of applications. As for typical coax cable speeds and ranges, you can see here, there is a, a cable, uh, coaxial cable data standard known as DOCSIS, which is what most of the major uh, cable uh, data and, and television providers use these days. Um, the, the DOCSIS uh, standard is designed to fit inside a, a standard uh, television channel, which in, in, in North America is about 6 megahertz wide. You will see that the Euro DOCSIS standard is, is actually a little bit, has a little bit higher data rate, and that's because a typical uh, European television channel is often 8 megahertz, which allows for a little bit more bandwidth and a little bit uh, faster downstream speed. Uh, the upstream speeds are a little bit slower because, again, because of the way historically cables, uh, television cables were installed, they're not always installed that well. And so the modulation needs to be a little bit simple to overcome the reflections and the impedance mismatches. And so the upstream speeds are sometimes a little bit slower. As, as the demand from customers for speeds have increased, and uh, the cable providers have struggled to, to meet that demand, the, the, the DOCSIS standard has involved to where yeah, they're still using these, these, these 6 or 8 megahertz channels, but now you can aggregate them for individual users. They can use more than one channel. And as you can see in the ensuing versions, the, the data rates go up, and they do that by using more than one channel per user. So the important coaxial characteristics, much like we saw with the fiber, you want to make sure that, that the signal isn't absorbed so much, that the signal attenuation is good, that there are no impedance mismatches that cause reflections and interference in the signal, and that all of the, the interconnections are, 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 are done with the highest possible quality. Advantages of coaxial cable. Um, as you can see here, it's, 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 it's fairly simple stuff. It's fairly robust stuff. It exists in a lot of houses and a lot of residences and in apartment buildings. And, and, and people know how to use it. They've, it's been around now for, for close to 50 years, uh, at least as, as practical as, as, as television cable. And uh, it's still a pretty good solution for, for a lot of users. Which brings us to our, our last uh, group of our last class of data cable, which is twisted pair data cable. Which twisted pairs have been around for, well, they've been around as long as, as telecommunications telephone systems have been around, which essentially means, you know, in, in the sense of data networks, they've been around forever. And twisted pairs evolved over time. They actually go back all the way to the, 19, to the 19th century with telegraphs, where the original telegraph wire, they literally strung a wire from one telegraph station and over some, some, some repeating to, a, to another station. It was just a single wire, and it was grounded at each end of the, of, of the telegraph wire. And people sent clicks over the wire, it's an early digital form. And those clicks were received at the other end, and depending on how long those clicks lasted and how fast they came, uh, people could, could understand what information was encoded on those clicks. Um, one of the problems that was, was discovered was that with a single wire grounded on each end is that actually the ground potential on both ends of the cable, of both ends of the wire, might actually be different. And when you have two different grounds, uh, for those of you who, who uh, are no electricity, you have a tendency to get a, get, a, get, a, get, a, get a loop current. And that causes noise and interference. 
and then you can't understand those clicks as, as easily. So someone came up with a bright idea. Okay, instead of one wire, let's use two wires. And then on both ends, we'll connect them, instead of to ground, we're, we'll connect them to a differential amplifier. And then that ground loop problem, in principle, will go away. And sure enough, that turned out to be a pretty good solution. Uh, the noise went down. And, and that was a good solution for a while. But then, as more electricity was used, as people started to use motors and streetcars and put power lines, people noticed that when, when interfering source, interference sources came close to those wires, you had that problem again. You started to get interference. One wire was closer to the interference source than the other wire. And the, the signal became unbalanced, and I got more noise. So someone either accidentally or intentionally figured out that if I cross those wires over every once in a while, every few hundred meters or so, that the noise on both wires tend to balance each other out, and the signal is a lot clearer. And with time, someone decided, OK, well, if, 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 a, few, if a few twists of the cable is good, more twists might be better. So let's, let's go. And, and eventually, as we developed cables, we got to the point where telephone cables became the twisted pairs that you see here. Uh, and those twisted pairs, as we see in the next slide, they're, they're pretty interesting. They have good bandwidth. You can get maybe up to 2 gigahertz, almost approaching coaxial cable bandwidth uh, if they're made very well. They're robust and flexible. And they're, 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 well, the people who make the cables may argue, but I think they're pretty easy to manufacture. Uh, you basically you draw a couple of wires, you put insulation on them, you twist them together. You know how you do that and make sure that the twist is, is is just right is another story. But in principle, I've been in a couple of these factories. You get 19 millimeter oxygen-free copper wire rod, and a few boxes of polymer. Uh, in principle, come into one side, and out the other side come the twisted cable pairs that you see here on on the left. Sometimes even with terminations on the end. Um, I've also, for the twisted pair, indicated the impedance equation for the same reason that you can see by, if you think about the dimensions between the distance between the wires and the diameters of those wires, they're generally a couple of millimeters apart. And the, 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 if you know wire gauges, the wire diameters are 22 to 24 gauge or 24 to 22 gauge wire. Um, and it works out that that impedance is about 100 ohms, which it, I think it's almost as much a factor of, of what a convenient geometry is for the cable as, as, as whether someone picked that number for a particular reason. But what's important is that the geometry, the spacing between those wires, and the diameter of those wires, so, so, so the surface quality of the wire, the drawing quality of the wire, the purity of the dielectric that's used for the insulation materials, and then if you think about a twisted pair as, as a, as a two-wire waveguide here, and then it's just it's bent into a, into a helix, you need to be very careful that, that, that this twisting is very consistent. Because otherwise, you're altering the, 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 either, either the diameter of the wire, the small a in the equation, or you're altering the, the space between the wires, the big D. Or if you're damaging the dielectric or stretching it or stressing it so that the the properties of the dielectric change, you're changing the epsilon. And then you're changing the, the impedance in the wire. And then you have that same problem as you had with cables. You have reflections, you have losses, you have interference. So twisted pairs have evolved over the last number, and especially in the last 20 years or so with, with the, in, 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 with the uh, development of Ethernet. And you can see here in this, this diagram here, there's about the, the twisted pair performance has increased by about four orders of magnitude since the, from the early 90s when, when 10 base T and, and it was, was, was initially, uh, in, was initially uh, established up till now where we're talking about oh, 40, 40 gigabit base T and there's even some discussion of 100 gigabit base T. And what you'll notice here is as the data speeds have, in, have advanced, so has the bandwidth, the, the electrical bandwidth of the, of the cable, which means the quality of the cable has had to increase. And what that has allowed is not only faster signaling, but uh, quieter signaling, more consistent, less reflections, less interference, 
Because in order to meet those data rates, you not only need to increase the signaling rate, but you need to increase uh, the modulation, the complexity of the modulation. The signal uh, inside those pulses is, is more complicated, and the receiver has to receive it very accurately uh, in order to, 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 to figure out exactly what information was being sent with each pulse. So uh, as you can see, the data rates have, Im have improved. We've gone for, for, for relatively short distances, 100 meters is, is, is what twisted pairs are usually seen for, for lands and for, for, for data centers. Uh, the speeds have, have, have advanced about four orders of magnitude over, over about 20 years. And to support those speed advances, of course, the electrical standards have to go along with that. And here in this table, you see some of the critical patterns again. The bandwidth goes up. The so-called the critical parameters that next is, is near-end crosstalk, the, 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 the talking or, or, or the interference from one set of twisted pairs to the other uh, next to each other at the termination points uh, has to be improved. Um, the balance, uh, the, the construction of the, of the cable has, has, has to be constantly improved. So-called alien crosstalk, that's, that's interference from, from cables that aren't inside the, the, the the twisted cable itself from another cable that might be nearby. And after a while, you find you can't even, even protect the, 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 you can't reduce the interference enough even by twisting and careful construction, so you need to shield it. You need to put a foil on top of the cable in order to, to, to protect on top of one twisted pair. You, 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 put, you put, essentially put aluminum foil or, 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 or a screen, a metal screen, to minimize the interference from one cable to the next. And this allows us to continually increase the bandwidth and to increase the data rates on, on twisted pairs. And in this diagram here, we see how those data, how the electrical standards, the, the so-called CAT standards, sort of support and go together with, with the base T standards, the data rate standards. And if one looks at this graph, you can sort of start to see that over time, the electrical standards and the data standards um, are continuing to go up to the right. They're, they're increasing with time, but that rate of increase is starting to slow down a bit. And the blue line sort of shows the trend for the kinds of speeds that are going to be required for, for core networks, for those middle, those high, very high data rate networks where all the data is brought together and transported over large distances. And the brown line, the other line, sort of shows the data rates that are going to be required at the so-called edge of the network, the, the, the data centers, at the user ends, at switches and routers. And you see that's, that's a little bit less because you're kind of on the sides of the network, sort of the way that, that small side roads don't necessarily need to, to have quite the performance that the high-speed autobonds or, or inter, interstate or, or auto route or motorway systems require. But they still require quite a good, quite, quite pretty impressive performance. And as you can see, for twisted pairs, the, the data rate's starting to, to, to bend over a little bit. And, and one can start to ask the question, how much longer can twisted pair data cables continue to keep up despite their other advantages of being easy to install, being relatively low cost, being easy to manufacture, being very convenient, being very standard? There's, there's a question of how much further they can go. And so, so what, what, what are those capacity limits? OK, well, it turns out there was some research done at Bell Labs back in the late 1940s from a guy named Claude Shannon. And he looked very carefully at, without making any specific assumptions, how much data can I put down a data cable? And it turns out the result is, is quite simple. It has only to do with the bandwidth of the cable and the signal-to-noise ratio with which you receive the transmitted signal at the other end of the cable. Now, this is, this is it's, 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 it's a very fundamental law. Uh, it applies only for, for the advanced student. It applies only for additive white Gaussian noise channels, but it turns out that's not such a huge limitation to, 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 to the equation. And what it enables you to do at, from, from a research point of view is to look at the data cables and say, well, how much further can we pursue this with, with electrical data cables? And, and when do we need to change the geometry 
so that the bandwidth increases because we have limits on signal to noise ratio. We have limits to with how far we can take the, the bandwidth of the cables. We can measure that. And so how much data can we transmit with, a, with, 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 a, with a, an electrical data cable? And so what you do is you go into the lab and you look at the, look at the, the elect, you put a twisted pair cable, you put it on a, on a spectrum analyzer, and you measure the insertion loss, that is how, how much the signal goes down with distance and with frequency. You measure the return loss, that's a, an indication of how, much, how many reflections there are in the cable. And then you all can also measure next infects. Those are, those are self-interference things. Those are other forms of reflections in the cable or crosstalk between uh, various cables, uh, various sub-pairs sub inside the cable. And you can determine from these complicated uh, radio frequency measurements just how much signal-to-noise ratio you can expect over a certain length of cable. And what's really interesting is on twisted pair cable, for example, this is a, a, a category 7A data cable, which is a fairly modern twisted pair data cable. If you look at the maximum theoretical capacity, it's over 50 meters in this case. It's very close to 100 gigabits per second. And that's, that's sort of the maximum. So when one looks back at the other data, and says, OK, what, what are happening to data rate speeds? What are, what, are, what are the user expectations? What are the requirements in the network? We can say with pretty decent predictive capabilities that, that, that in, in their current form, twisted pair copper data cables are going to support needs for about another 10 years or so. Uh, afterwards, we're going to have to make some, some other thinking about how data cables, will, how, how, how uh, networks will be cabled. Um, some of the important characteristics, again, it's, it's, this, this looks a lot like what you saw in the, with the other cables, with both fiber optics and with coaxial cables. You want low signal attenuation. You want no impedance mismatches. You don't want reflections. And you also, in addition to that, you want to make sure that the crosstalk between the twisted pairs, you want to make sure that various twisted pairs are, are, are well isolated. And this is why uh, a lot of newer cables tend to be shielded both internally and externally. Um, drivers in, in data centers. So as another parameter besides speed and bandwidth and data rate, that you put with cables, you have to think about what's happening with the places, the practical places where these cables are being installed. And some of the things that are that are that are evolving uh, as issues are things like power consumption. Data center power consumption is one of the fastest growing uh, electrical energy consumption sources in the world. So. In addition to the data speed considerations, you have to start thinking about, well, which cables are the most energy efficient? Which cables are the easiest to, to, to change out? Which are the most flexible? Which are the greenest? Which have the lowest life cycle costs? There, there, there are a lot, a lot more uh, parameters that come, in, come in, in into the equation. And as you can see here, the, the, the in a data center, the data center, the use is growing tremendously. Um, data bits, the servers generate a lot of power, but the bits themselves don't have that much power. They go out and in uh, over the cables, but the, 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 the rest, all of the switching, the noise and the heat that's generated by the servers and the data equipment has to be, has to be dissipated. So you have to also have to have uh, air conditioning or, or, or in, in, in these systems. And that takes power as well. So, so that also plays into the choice of, of data cable selection. So to finish up the twisted pair part of this speech, the, the twisted, care, twisted pair cables, they continue to be viable in data centers. But they're only going to be viable as long as they can, they can keep up with the data speed and the energy consumption is, is 
at least advantageous or, or comparable with some of the other, other options. So twisted pairs are going to remain a practical solution at least for a while longer in their current form. So the conclusions are, and you can read them, networks are getting faster, cables are getting faster, there are a couple of two or three core choices in, in, in network cabling. They all have advantages. Some, they all have some disadvantages. And the cable designer needs to look very carefully at, 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 at what he needs, uh, what the requirements are, what the life cycle costs are, what the energy impacts are, and of course, what, what, what the user experience will look like. It's a complex space. 